The views and opinions expressed in the following program do not necessarily reflect the policies and the position of Now You Know. Good evening. Welcome to Viewpoint. Together with experts and newsmakers, we'll make sense of the week's biggest issues and stories. I'm Barnaby Lowe. In tonight's conversation. The Philippines' COVID-19 numbers still on the rise as the rest of the world continues to grapple with the pandemic. But the Duterte administration says the country is doing relatively better than others in terms of number of cases and deaths. In fact, presidential spokesperson Harry Rock has celebrated when confirmed numbers by the health department did not reach 40,000 on June 30th, as predicted by a team of researchers at the University of the Philippines. Wala na po, palalo na tayo. We beat the UP prediction po. We beat it. So congratulations, Philippines. Let's do it again in July. The Philippines' coronavirus curve remains on an upward trend, with the next prediction at over 60,000 by the end of July. So tonight, to discuss whether or not we are winning against the uh, pandemic, that is COVID-19, we have three experts from the field of medicine, from the field of science, from the field of math, and you've seen them on TV, you've seen them in the media. So uh, they actually don't need any further introduction, <laughs> but I'd like to uh, introduce them anyway. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Unilia Chon, uh, Dr. Tony Liachon is a public health advocate and he was a former advisor of the Coronavirus National Task Force. Next, we have uh, Dr. Benjamin Paul, who writes a blog. He blogs about the daily statistics of COVID-19, not just means, but world statistics and blog that we publish every day on the ABS-CBN News website. He is uh, a clinical pharmacologist, a biostatistician, and infectious diseases doctor. And last but not the least, we have uh, Professor Yido Did. He is a mathematics professor at the University of the Philippines, and he is a member of the UP Optica research team, which, of course, <laughs> as we all know now, predicted uh, 40,000 COVID-19 cases by the end of June 30th. And uh, I think the prediction now for the end of July is uh, 60,000. 60, Over 60,000, is that right, Professor David? How did you come yes. up with that? Yeah. 60,000, yeah. Well, like I always um, explain to uh, lay, laymen, I mean, this is the layman explanation. Um, basically, what we're just trying to do is um, calculate the speed of the pandemic or how fast the pandemic is spreading and then we just um, use that to extrapolate into the future so uh, my example is for example you Barnaby you're riding a bicycle and where I'm trying to predict how far you will travel in let's say 30 minutes and if I for example um, uh, I use some measurements to estimate your speed and I get your average speed let's say 30 kilometers per hour then in 30 minutes, you will have traveled maybe 15, uh, 15 kilometers. So we just do a simple multiplication. So it's just a projection. It doesn't mean that the 15 kilometers is what you will end up with. So I think that's where um, a lot of confusion comes in. Uh, we're not trying to predict the future. I'm not saying uh, you will travel 15 kilometers. So it could happen that you will have traveled only 12 kilometers. And what does that mean? It means that you have slowed down somewhere along the way. Maybe you're on an uphill climb, um, your bicycle, you're, you're, you're going around the curb and you had to go slower. Or it could be that you're, you traveled um, 18 kilometers, which is fast, uh, you traveled more than what I projected. And that could have happened because maybe um, you sped up, you, you were going downhill, which I, I didn't know about, and because of that, you were going faster. So that's how we make projections. Basically, we, we're just calculating the uh, rate of spread of the pandemic. 
and then use that to project into the future. Um, the calculation, of course, is not this straightforward. We use uh, an epidemiological model to make these estimates. And the uh, rate of spread is, um, well, it's not the R0, but it's proportional to the R0 that people talk about. Um, and this is also proportional to the doubling rate. So when we talk about these figures, all we mean is that we're measuring how fast the pandemic is spreading. And if it's going faster or going slower. So if we did not miss the projection, for example, we missed 40,000, it just means that maybe the pandemic slowed down um, a little bit. And I know there are some technical it's issues positive. here that, yes, <laughs> that that uh, Dr. Tony might uh, describe, uh, discuss later about um, data backlog and stuff like that. But um, without getting into the, those technicalities, for example, if we did miss 40,000, then it's fair to say that um, we have slowed down the pandemic, at least with respect to the initial projection, at least with respect to the rate that we measured. So it may, maybe we slowed it down um, a little bit so that it missed the 40,000. Mm -hmm. So I hope that was um, you know uh, uh, yeah. something. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. So so in short, it's it's an estimate, right? I mean, you, you yes, can't it's an when you estimate. Say, it's just yeah, when you say estimate, you can't really be act, you know, one hundred percent accurate about it. Yeah. Uh, of course, I mean you're this. I mean, like any model, uh, it's going to be an estimate. You're you know you're using assumptions. But as long as it's within a certain range, uh, I think you could call it a a you know, uh, uh, an educated mm -hmm. estimate, uh, okay. for example. So, yeah, just like when we predict, uh, for example, we predict what the weather will be like tomorrow. It's, there, there are some um, assumptions made and, you know, there's a statistical probability that rain will happen. We cannot say with exact, um, you know, with accuracy what will happen. And then it's the same thing, for example, if you're trying to predict the stock market, which is very difficult, but you give maybe a range or, you know, some likelihood or, for example, you're proje uh, projecting, uh, here's another example. Um, uh, someone wants to project the, int or the payments for a loan for a five-year or 10-year loan. Then you're making projections with respect to the interest rate. The interest rate can change. It can increase, decrease. But your projection will not be exactly the same. You cannot um, yeah. tell the loan officer, hey, you know, you told me that it will be just this amount. Well, they said, well, the, the interest rate went up, so you know, it was just an estimate. So everything will have to be within uh, the context of the of the assumptions. So, so thank you for those analogies, because I have to tell you, when I was in UP, I only took math one, and my final grade was 2.75. Math one. <laughs> so you're going to have to go slow on the math on me yes so i'm gonna go back to the sixty thousand figure later because um i want to dissect that previous prediction that you had forty thousand um and maybe i'll ask uh you know either uh dr benji or uh dr tony about this because um you you know uh our viewers, you probably didn't see it, but our viewers uh, saw that soundbite from Harry um, Roque. Harry Roque from from presidential from spokesperson from Harry Roque saying that, um, well, we've won because the end of June, uh, the numbers did not reach 40,000. But Dr. Benji, you've been analyzing these numbers and um, maybe we can show the latest uh, DOH COVID situationer. Um, if we have it, yeah, um, we have. It. Okay, I mean, um, our, our staff can 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 show it in a little bit, but um, I do have it here, and what we have, you know, the positive individuals and the confirmed individuals have always been different, and the difference, uh, my observation keeps getting bigger or if, if they don't keep getting bigger they're they're there you know in in the thousands so either i mean dr benji dr tony maybe one of you can or both of you can explain that difference you know and the positive positivity rate as well hasn't been changing the cumulative positivity rate has been at around seven percent but the daily positivity rate 
has been going up like eight, nine, ten percent. So, like I said, uh, I'm not really good at math, but it just there just seems to be some inconsistencies. So, Benji, Benji, please. Benji. Uh, okay. Well, um, the test, the positive test results, and I guess everybody can correct me. The positive test results that come out of the testing centers. Um, include those patients that are that have retests done so they need to sift that they need to sift through that because i don't think the department of health um, is able to sift through even all of these um, repeat tests and like for example if you have the same patient's name juan de la cruz and he he has um, juan maria de la cruz and he uses it uh, he has he has actually two names, and then he goes to another hospital to have a retest done. Um, it might be the same patient in the end, because mm -hmm. not all of the patients get tested at the same facility where they start off with. So that's that's probably one of the reasons why they don't jive. Um, but lately, and I've noticed that um, I, I tried that actually the other day, trying to predict the total number of um, positives we will get. Uh, or new confirmed cases we will get in the, in a day. I, I tried doing that. I looked at all of the um, the, the the positive patients that that come out in a day. So more or less we will fall within that number. Mm. So if if the total number of tests, test total number of confirmed positive cases for the day reported is let, let's say 1,275, we will fall within that range. 1,000. To 1,250, more or less, give or take, plus or minus 10 to 20 percent of cases. And I, I, I noticed that, that that was the trend until, of course, they changed the way they reported, which drove me crazy again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dr. Tony. But, yeah. I'm, I'm a clinician. Um, I'm a cardiologist. I'm an internist. I'm not a mathematician. So I based that on. Um, in the clinic on vital signs and of course when we mean vital signs the blood pressure heart rate respiratory temp and of course the signs and symptoms mm -hmm. so i just look at of course at the doh data and then i just talk to benji and then i'll go to john hopkins and the, and then read about the up study and a lot of things and then try to come up with your decision so that as when i was ntf advisor i based this on a lot of readings plus clinical so, for example, here you see a lot of positive cases. Positive cases. These patients, even if though they are asymptomatic, they will they will be admitted later on, and that will actually overwhelm the healthcare system. So, what is important to me is the increase in the cases. If there's no you know downward trend for that, it, it means to say that's active, and mm -hmm. since it's not uh, granular and real time, you expect that it might be underreported. So, for me. Cases are very important because it will actually predict what's happening there. So, for example, there when we went to Cebu, I'll just give an example by, based on heuristic thinking or intuitive thinking. Yeah. So, so to me, if there's an active case, there's increased viral transmission. So, I was observing the data of the Department of Health. And the at that time, from May 15 to May 31, I noticed that Cebu was okay. But they, when they were actually classified under GCQ, the, the figures for Cebu started to go up. Mm -hmm. And then I was alarmed. I think that was on a few days before we went to Cebu, June 11 or 12. I called up the regional director, Dr. Jimmy Bernadas, whether what is the situ what was the situation there. Mm -hmm. And he said it was okay. So we went there June 11, and then we, we divided the group into meeting with the political leaders and then of course with dr jim bernardas that's the region 7 director and all the medical directors of the private hospitals and vicente soto and then we asked questions like this secretary vince Dixon was with us and together with uh, executive vice president ted orbosa who's also um, as a as an advisor to secretary galvez and all of the medical directors i'll tell you the icu almost filled up isolation beds, mechanical vent. So we're actually bursting to the brim. And so anytime, alam mo na na ECQ ng diagnosis. Now, my, my diagnosis at that time, 
So sorry uh, for this uh, this to be very Pero hindi transparent. yung numbers, Doc Tony. Uh kumbaga, the numbers that we're seeing that the DOH was reporting at the time don't reflect what was happening in Cebu. Exactly. And there's a uh, disjoint or uh, disparity as well dun sa city health na nire-report and also the medical community. To me, mas okay if the medical community the hospitals directly magre-report kasi yun yung talagang accurate. Eh. And then, ang problema lang, uh, I'm not sure about the reporting style of the region because kung ganyan yan, you don't have to wait for uh, June 15 so that you can arrest already the epidemic. Kung nakikita mo yung upward trend, right, right there and then, June 7, you can declare it. Eh. Ang nangyari, nag-ECQ ka. And then after that, a few days, the entire IATF and the NTF went to Cebu and declared an ECQ. So, so sabi ko, as a clinician, uh, as a doctor, I know the course of coronary artery disease from asymptomatic to being bypassed. So I know the course already. So my thinking process, I just look at the vital signs and in my 100 days uh, stay at the NTF, I could already declare what would be the, the uh, classification of the quarantine based on these particular signs and symptoms. And then the other thing, if the... Um, healthcare capacities are not okay, you'll be sure that this particular locality will not be ready once you actually impose ECQ there. So that's one thing. So I always look at the healthcare capacity of that particular locality. Eh, ano, ang alam ko at that time, hindi ready ang Cebu because we went there, uh, kokonti in testings. Ang isolation area, kokonti ang tao. And then we went and asked them, but why testing uh, will not be done? Ang kwento nila is just because uh, there will be no funds for this particular patient. So, alam na, contact tracing is just a week ago when uh, Mayor Magalong called me up that he would be the one to install and establish the contact tracing in, in Cebu through the request of the political leaders. So, ibig sabihin, at the end of the day, in the midst of crisis, the healthcare capacity of Cebu is not ready. Hanggang so, ngayon. these are important things that I think we need to explain to the public. Uh, on how we would come up with a decision on the quarantine classification. Because this, um, yung math numbers na intindihan natin yan, uh, being a physician and the may exposure, but I think those simple vital signs should be explained to the public kung ganun. And it boils down again, ha, dun sa aking comment dati, forgive me uh, for uttering that in uh, social, yung sense of urgency, Yung transparent communication, very, very important sa akin yan. And real-time and granular data. At the end of the day, all of the decisions of the IATF will be anchored on credible uh, real-time granular data. Do, do you, uh, Professor Guido and uh, Doc Benji, do you share that frustration? Uh, you know, Doc Tony mentioning real-time granular data. And um, it just seems... I'm I'm a layman. I'm not a, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a mathematician. But I I think I get what uh, Dr. Tony is uh, saying. Uh, maybe uh, Professor Guido. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, concern. Yes. Um, Go ahead. Uh, we've been looking at this uh, this um, uh, early April. And it's been, uh, you could say, it's been the basis of our um, uh, projections of our models. And if it's not accurate, then it will affect our models. Now, we can do some uh, adjustments. If there are some data lags, we can sort of uh, estimate how much the lag is, for example. Uh, and we used to do granular level analysis. Now it's getting a little bit more uh, frustrating because if you look at the data, there's about uh, 40,000, I think, by now, I think there's 41,000 cases. 41. And, um, yeah, 41,000, sorry. Yeah. Um, and then I think there's about 4,000 what we call uncategorized cases, or those cases without a region as assigned to them. So, for example, mm -hmm. you have 18,000 in NCR, and even in NCR, there are a lot of cases which don't have the uh, city indicated. So, for example, it says NCR Metro Manila, but I don't know if it's from Quezon City or Pasig. 
And it's very difficult to do granular analysis if your data is missing a lot of um, parts. Now you can, of course, you can do things like um, prorate the data and say, well, maybe part of this um, uncategorized data is here, but uh, that's also a bit presumptuous if we do that. So um, we can do that partly and we can do it, well, analyze the data without the, well, with, with some missing um, information. And uh, 4,000 cases that are uncategorized. Um, I don't know if uh, um, Dr. Tony has some knowledge about these um, cases or something, but, um, and this is, um, aside from the Department of Health backlog, which I heard is, well, they said they cleared the backlog. Um, of course, there's still a big discrepancy between the positive, uh, positive uh, tested individuals, that number, which everybody can see in the Department of Health um, uh, 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 tracker, and then the official number of cases. And of course, that's not even including the uh, okay. fresh cases and the back, uh, well, the data lag cases, which of course is normal. We expect, or we don't expect um, testing to be, you know, to have results immediately. So maybe it takes three days or so. Uh, but sometimes when I look at the data, you know, I see a case which was reported today, and then it says date of onset was March. So. Or, Let's say it was reported yesterday, but the date of onset was March. So, I mean, that was like three, that's like three months of, um, you know, a lag. You know, it's only reported today, but this case actually happened in March. So, so it means when we were looking. Yeah, that affects yeah, the integrity sorry. of your um, prediction. Yes? Um, mm -hmm. It does affect the, um, the uh, projections in a way, yes. But like I said, you can account for these things if you see some kind of pattern with how the data is, you know, how, if it's lagged or if it's late, um, you can you can try to uh, make, uh, you know, I mean, no data is perfect. So uh, that's what a data scientist would expect, uh, which I'm sure uh, Dr. Cole would uh, agree to. If you work with data, you, you don't expect perfect data, even if you have data from field help or something. So you just have to account for some of these, um, flop, uh, let's say errors, and then, you know, as, as long as the data is maybe 90%, Good. I think you can make um, reasonable um, in inferences from the data. Doc Benji, is it ninety percent good? Um, Guido is very nice. <laughs> When I say you're very nice, you're really very nice because I'm not as uh, as as um, nice as that. But it, just just over the week, and it, it's to me um, when I analyze the data, it's kind of frustrating because I agree with with Guido um, that there are a lot of unknowns. They, they they categorize it as unknown. They put it under the the basket of others, and then you get surprised. You don't know where the others are when you try to look. For the others, you will you get to find out that the following day all the others are actually in the national capital region. So you have to add most of those others into the national capital region. And over the last few weeks, um, the last few weeks actually has been horrible, uh, especially with more unknowns. And uh, they just just dump it there because there's no tag location as a matter of fact but the right term to that is there if you do the data drop there is no tagged uh, location for these patients or no tag residences for them so uh, like for example in, in when they announced the 294 cases the very few cases the other day because of the 19 hours working time and that's the only information they got 60 of them were from NCR. All the 60 from NCR were under unknown. All, 100% uh, of then them were unknown. The so, yeah. so, you know, you just don't know what you're going to, you don't even know where these patients are from. And I understand them, but there's a large gap actually between the um, the LGU report and the national and the national agency's report. And I think everybody will agree with me. Right. The, 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 there, there really is a gap between like like for example where I stay in Muntinlupa they have 400 the, my, my, my mayor says we have 400 plus but when you look at the DOH they have 600 plus and I don't know where the 200 excess are coming from and who's telling the truth or who's, who's, 
whose data is right and whose data is wrong. But if you, like I like 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 um, like Guido mentioned, um, I I think my question goes back to to to, to Guido and uh, well not, not not really a question but a comment. Like if if there are things that they cannot account for now, do they even go back to all of the things that they don't account for today? Because that that that's something that that they need to to reconcile. And, uh, you know, as data, to me, the, whoever handles the data, whoever is the data manager, owns the data. And you've got to be responsible when you own data. Um, you have to know how to manage this data and not just leave everybody else guessing uh, and making assumptions. Because we, we, we end up doing that. We, we have too many assumptions. Um, and, and, like, let's just go back to the 40,000 figure uh, June 30 because a lot of people were pointing out that it was possible that we've already hit 40,000 that day because on that day the uh, positive tests were already at around 47,000 so entirely possible that the number of confirmed cases actually surpassed 40,000. Is that right. is that a fair analysis? Uh, Tony? Yeah, I think so because um, uh, prior to the fresh and late, this just a little bit of story of here. Uh, one month ago, I actually articulated during one of the meetings of the NTF that um, perhaps they should address the backlog. I think, Benji, we had the talk about it and then we said that uh, perhaps uh, what they should do is actually finish that in, in one wave and then report that and then reintegrate into the curve. But what they did is actually divided into fresh, which is actually within three days and then four days. So our curves went haywire. But you remember that. One, so you remember yeah, but the good news here is that uh, Rosette Verhere has announced that next week there'll be yeah, I heard that. <laughs> oh, but then, Here we go uh, again. Another new process. Oh, yeah, my problem Lord. Kasi, ang, ang problem, Benji, kasi from the start, they, they should have a strategic plan for data management. Like, for example, kung may problema tayo sa encoders, or data managers, everything. Kasi all of the terms, uh, PUI, PUM, and then right now, fresh and late and okay na, then merong COVID kaya. Then people would wonder what's really right. And that's, I'm always going to ask that actually does that affect the confidence in the numbers? You know, the, the fact that they keep changing the process and then they have the fresh and the late cases, but then it turns out that the late cases are only three or four days late. So they're not really late cases. Um, I mean, how does that affect, you know, the ordinary people's? confidence in these numbers well, well to me as a, a member of the NTF you're, if you're beginning to doubt right now the, the main um, I mean the, the data is actually the main reason for deciding on the level of the quarantine classification and if I were an insider and I was beginning uh, actually I actually asked that question during our meeting at the palace about real-time granular data but hey, after 100 days, we're we're still here, so you must do something about it because you know um, there's there are two epicenters right now. You have Manila, and then you have Cebu, and then you have um, spread in contiguous area like uh, Samar and Leyte. Now, if you're not going to anticipate the spread of the virus, then what would this particular data would actually help us? And in terms, if you cannot actually predict and avert any epidemic. Then I don't think there's a use right now for this data. Because you know, the role ko as a preventive health advocate is to prevent the disease. Eh. That's yeah. why I, 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 I used to work uh, on the downstream, seeing patients right now uh, being bypassed and with heart attacks. I want to prevent patients going to the hospital. And to me, it is anchored actually on, a, you know. In, in my, as a clinical person, I usually base that on vital signs and history and PE. 80% you get the diagnosis. But right now, since you're actually doubting, of course, you have a question on the, on the data, how, how can you have? To me, the dictum is 
correct diagnosis, then you have a correct treatment. If you begin to doubt right now your data, how can you be able to adapt or to come up with the right treatment? And that's the, ba the basic assumption of most people right now. You agree, uh, Doc Benji? I mean, you're a mathematician, but you're also an infectious <laughs> diseases doctor, yeah. Yeah, well, um, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of these data, uh, a lot of the things that we do, um, in the and I, I I defer to Guido when when it comes to this. You know, while while I'm a math major and my master's degree is in mathematics, I I've done that a long time ago. Um, what the, all all the numbers that we put together and everything that we do in the realm of mathematics has has, has an assumption. We we can't we, we don't do things without without um, any presumption. That means that we need something to kick us off. Because zero is not a good number, so we need we need a lot of factors that tell us that this is the, the this is the presumption. If you do, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, like um, now some of the other institutions don't just use R not or R effect. What they use is now casting, and um, the, uh, the that's the trend that they're using in the UK. Um, because they're using presumptions also uh, of lag time. So when you have lag time, you, you can do now casting and you can do forecasting based on, that's why it's called now casting. Um, you're, you're forecasting something that's happening now uh, based on um, a lot of assumptions as well. And that's the reason that it's very important we get at least a real, a sense of accuracy, but it, it's spotty everywhere. To, to, to me, to me, it, it's spotty everywhere. We're, we're getting this okay, type of data from let's you know, everyone. Yeah, maybe let's look at the data from today and from yesterday, right? So today we had a total of 1,494 cases. And then yesterday we had a total of uh, more than 1,500 cases. So both days, were the highest and the second highest increases in a single day. What do these numbers tell you, Professor Guido? Well, um, obviously, it's not good news for us. Um, okay. Even with backlog data, uh, even with incomplete data, I mean, if this is the number that they're releasing, and um, Dr. Ko is correct. Um, your, your, our models, our mathematical models, are only as good as uh, the data. So if it's, uh, you know, the usual uh, saying is garbage in, garbage out. And I wouldn't exactly call that, um, you know, our projections to be totally garbage. Uh, I think it does have some value because the fact that we're, you know, at least getting to be some within the range of whatever these numbers are, if these are true numbers or if these have some backlog, uh, involved, um, we're not sure, but uh, definitely this is not a good trend. If we're getting very, a uh, very high number of cases now, um, we are maybe getting to critical, um, a critical situation with our uh, hospital resource utilization, which I well, when I last checked the data, it says about seventy percent in Cebu, and I don't know if that's uh, also. Um, problematic data. Maybe, maybe Dr. Tony will <laughs> enlighten us if there, if the the data on hospital resource utilization is, you know, is accurate. Even if that one is accurate. But as far as the um, uh, confirmed cases, if you're if we're getting 1,500, that 60,000 will be, I mean, our projection it will be passed easily uh, by end of July. It, it could conceivably go up to 70 and 80. And if you check, Indeed. and I know what? people think. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's possible. And then if you check, uh, I know people say, you know, you know we're, we're putting out scary numbers. But um, for if you look at the end of every month, the number has essentially doubled since the previous month. So end of April, it was about 8,000. 8, end of May, it's about 37,000. Uh, sorry, end of April, uh, let me check. Yeah, end of April about 8,000, end of May about um, 18,000, end of April about 36. So, it, you know, the doubling aspect 
even if you don't do mathematical models, you can just look at it as doubling. And it's like a doubling time. The, the doubling time is about the same. So 30 days. From so 37, doubling, yes. The doubling rate has uh, slowed down to seven days. Just today, uh, you stick for hair said that. Is that, would you agree I, with that? I, I, we don't use the doubling rate, so I will have to check with that if that is true. Um, that's, that's my standard answer. <laughs> I, I agree with Guido. Uh, we don't use doubling rate. Um, the doubling time is probably a better indicator. And uh, well, so far the doubling time has actually been almost 30 days. Like, so if you have the, the, the right numbers now, right? Like if you're 35,000 now, or if you're 40,000 now, then in 30 days should be 80,000. That that's that's the way it is. I mean, it, it, we just right. It, it, you don't even need to be a mathematician to to, to look at it that way. But Dr. But you, wanted, you know, the, yeah. the, the critical utilization rate for Manila is about 30 to 30 to 40 percent. And if you're receiving high numbers the last two days, and I think most of these patients, um, I, I stay of course in in, in Manila. Um, I can just ask some of my friends, medical directors, and ask them. It, it's it's becoming full right now. I mean, I just called two uh, medical directors, a friend of mine. So if you have yeah. high cases in the NCR, and then you have high cases, 70 percent in in uh, Cebu, you have two problems here, and then you have some contiguous area right now plus the locally stranded individuals right now, plus um, your importation risk. And then you have the, the rainy season coming in. Mm -hmm. So these are, there are things that you, you need to project as well, I mean, clinically. So I'm not pretty confident about our scenario moving forward uh, with, with this data and plus the other factors that I mentioned. The, uh, yeah. You're hearing that um, hospitals in Metro Manila are getting full again because, I mean, I'm hearing those stories, but I can't really confirm because, I, I mean, I can't really check, you know, the hospitals. Um, but I am hearing from some doctor friends yeah. that... Uh, yeah, the, the reason behind that, um, uh, I, I'll tell you, I'm, because it's about, uh, it's, it's about business, of course, if you know that for example, a certain hospital will be filled up. You know, there's a stigma attached to a certain hospital kung COVID ka, di ba, natatakot. And therefore, yung admission rate baka bumaba eh. But I think we need to be transparent about it eh, so that we can guide the IATF on their decision. Kasi uh, that, that, that was my experience in Cebu eh. Sorry ah, uh, from my colleagues from Cebu. So if you try to curtail yung information na yan, it may not actually help the business sector because in the long run, tan mo, nag ECQ lockdown did. And then, lahat tayo losing end right now. Now, if you recognize right now that the hospital is full and then owned by the business community, then you have to accept it and alert the, the political leader so they could have actually stopped it even before June 15. So, ako, ang point ko dyan is that the Department of Health should ask the hospitals right now for their actual data on critical utilization rate. Huwag yung ibo-volunteer kasi they would surrender naman the data eh, kung talagang i-aas mo eh, so that you can that, get the accurate numbers. Is that the problem the, that the government, because I, from what I'm um, getting from you, Dr. Tony, you're saying that the government has been reactive in, um, and not proactive enough. Um, but the WHO, since you mentioned Cebu, the WHO just said that sa Tagalog, you know, ang, the problem sa Cebu was because pasaway yung mga tao sa Cebu. I, I have an answer to that. Actually, I responded that on Twitter and Facebook. Kasi I went there. Eh. The mm -hmm. first problem is always leadership and governance. And, which inamin naman ni Mayor Edgar Labella. And, and you see din naman di, the behavior of leaders there, no, eh, about two ob or uh, wearing face masks, and then their management of the data, all right. Plus, of course, the overall culture. But at the end of the day, everything is about leadership and governance. Eh. So, hindi lang yan based on the social aspect. Eh. Uh, anything that would fail right now in terms of averting a pandemic cannot only be addressed by the social aspect. 
based on the reference models na nakita natin, let's say South Korea, Vietnam, and even uh, New Zealand, it's about leadership and governance. Eh. And preparation at the start. During the index cases, uh, we know naman January uh, to February. And then that dapat yun, nag-buy time tayo right now to prepare our healthcare capacity. But we only declare our ECQ March 15. And then hindi rin natin na-prepare healthcare capacity. Even up to now, we're struggling right now per LGU in terms of fulfilling yung measures natin in healthcare capacity. So you're saying the ECQ was not u fully utilized, right? right? That's what you're saying, yeah? Right. It's uh, basically the hammer and dance concept of Thomas Pueyo that during the lockdown, the ECQ, dapat ni ramp up natin kagad yung testing centers natin, um, establish isolation uh, uh, facilities and quarantine facilities, and then establish natin ng contact tracings natin. Merong bright spots, no? let's say, Mayor Magalong at the start. In start na kagad ng uh, healthcare capacity, even the contact tracings. And then, naging reference models in the Philippines. What I'm saying is that, from the very start, sana may blueprint on what to do. But if you remember, during the Senate hearing about contact tracings on, on uh, the first three cases in Senate, we were not prepared, di ba? Naalala mo? Why not use the police during that time? And that gave actually the impetus for Mayor Magalong to use the contact tracing, being an intelligence officer and established in Baguio. Kaya, um, nakasama ko siya for, you know, almost 100 days. We've been to seminar lectures on contact tracing. Prepared the prepared. So right now, there's a uh, move right now to uh, adapt the contact tracing infrastructure of Baguio to Cebu City. But we are in the midst of crisis, Barnaby. We are yeah. in the midst of crisis. And ngayon pa lang tayo mag establish ng contact tracings. Parang may gusto sabihin si uh, Doc Benji. Uh, no, really. Uh, actually, uh, I, was just, I was going to just say, um, you know, number one, it's easy. It's kind of easy to, to predict more or less, uh, to correlate more or less if um, the numbers that are coming out of of the DOH are accurate or not. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because, like I said, all you need to do, because they're very transparent now with their COVID Gaia and their, their new website on the COVID-19 tracker, all you need to do is to go through all of the testing sites that they have all the testing facilities. And that's what I do. I mean, I just get like, for example, Allegiant, Cebu TB Center, and um, Vicente Soto are their three major in Cebu. If you take the total for the positives for the day, that's almost the same total as you will get for the reports. But it's not the same thing in Metro Manila. Um, and then the second thing that I was going to just make a comment was, uh, Dr. Tony is right. Uh, when I was talk when we, you know, I, I was talking to Tony about this before, and he was asking me. I was telling him that the only way you can get out of a quarantine is you have to make sure that every local government unit is has its own isolation center. It has its own isolation facility. Every LGU must have its own isolation facility and have at least its own testing facility in that particular province, region, or whatever, in that city. Because everything is congested now in Metro Manila. There are testing centers in Metro Manila. Yeah. And there's so many of them. Um, but if you look at the different provinces, of course, nobody wants to invest putting a testing center somewhere in uh, Apri or somewhere all the way down in Holo because you really will not get a lot of patients because it's a money-making venture as well. But um, they have to use, because um, the way I see it now, most of the cases are actually in the lower socioeconomic class. And that's where it's spreading. Uh, you like like here in our local government, you see sitio after sitio after sitio after sitio. They they lock down the barangays for two days and for I don't know why only two days and for what purpose is two days because we know that the virus lasts much longer than that and that that did not even make any infectious disease or scientific sense to me. Locking them down for two days for for a reason that I cannot even fathom. Uh, but it, it's crazy. Because you have isolation facilities, use the isolation facilities, put the people that are sick there, put the people that are positive there, and then do contact tracing. And then you eventually you, you'll get better. 
things might get better. Right. So you mentioned the testing centers everywhere and isolation facilities everywhere. Are you concerned about the spread of COVID-19 nationwide? Because, you know, a few weeks ago or several weeks ago, we were talking about Metro Manila, uh, perhaps uh, Calabarzon. And then we were talking about Cebu City. And now we're talking about, you know, more and more cities and municipalities and more and more provinces that had zero cases and now have, you know, a few to several cases. How, how concerned are you about that? Uh, are you asking me? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, me, I get surprised. I get I get the shocker of the day every day. I go. I go through the data. Like for example, there was a time that I was shocked at the data of Region 8. I mean, you know, in a week's time, or mock in itself was a surprise. I, I, everybody will agree with me with that. They had one case. A day later, they had two cases more. A day later, they had five cases more. And then they have 20 cases. Then th they, that that was it. And then Caraga was another surprise. Oh, they, they, it's a sleepy town, Region 13. They have one case every other day. Then one day it just booms. Well, was so, it really a surprise, Dr. Tony? Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I had the Balik Provincia yeah. program had, and, and, you know, all these people going back to their provinces. Yeah. Um, my comments that I was able to visit Caraga and I have been asked by the mayor, Ronnie Lagdada, to be a consultant for Caraga. So I told... Um, I told them that if there's mobility right now, uh, a rural migration, either because of the locally stranded individuals, our overseas contract workers, and the Balik Provincia, and the, if the healthcare capacity is not ready, you're not ready to admit that. You, you just need to quarantine them. But how can you be able to isolate them? So there was a time that they requested uh, they were given a very lax uh, quarantine classification. Then I said, you know, you have to revert back to the ECQ since you're actually having increased cases right now so by time. And that, and they actually uh, followed my advice because, alam mo, Barnaby, uh, using the military uh, plane, we went to Dabao about a month ago. It's just 30 minutes from Caraga. And yung resosila from uh, Caraga, Magagaling panandabaw. So, if you have to the ease up in terms of your transport and mobilization, eventually dadating din yung virus dun sa peripheral areas. Eh. So, my advice is for the local government unit in the countryside to prepare kasi there's no way that uh, this LSI will actually stay in Manila. 121,000, then you have a lot of overseas contract workers and people will move. And you cannot prevent people from moving. And therefore, the right approach is actually to have an LGU blueprint, to have a checklist of their healthcare capacity. And I would agree with Benji in terms of um, preparation. Um, even without, even with zero cases right now, you, you need to prepare at this time, especially... Well, uh, the the, 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 the Balik Provincia per is a good is a good project, but it is not timely at this point in time. And that's the reason why I think the governments even stopped the LSI and even the OFW and even the Balik Provincia. This is not the right time because the healthcare capacity in the peripheral areas, Region 8 and some areas are not ready. I want to ask uh, Professor Guido. Um, I I read... I love uh, Professor... Na disconnect ako. Uh, no, I think you're still... Professor Guido? Um, you're you're with us, okay. <laughs> I think um, uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Benji instead, you know, uh, because one of the key findings uh, in the UP study is, uh, you know, whenever we were opening up the economy uh, in NCR, uh, Professor Guido, are you there? There was a problem with the network. Ah, uh, okay, lang. Uh, actually, you were you were with us the whole time. Yeah. Uh, pero yung, uh, Dr. Benji, I'll, I'll ask you anyway. <laughs> um, and maybe uh, Dr. Tony, you can also chime in on this. Uh, but the UP study, kasi, um, one of the key findings is whenever we were opening up the economy, the numbers were going up. So 
I mean, what does that? Uh, ayan, Professor Guido. You there? Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Yeah. I, okay. I no. I no. Have... No problem. I I was gonna ask you about one of the your key findings, which is that whenever we were opening up the economy in Metro Manila, the numbers rose. I mean, what does that mean? Well, um, of course, um, I think I, I heard uh, Dr. Tony say that uh, mobility is one of the drivers. Yes, for sure, mobility is one of the drivers. So as we open up the economy, it is to be expected that we will get more cases. This was just a natural um, result or consequence of this. So it's not saying we shouldn't open or what we should do, but um, definitely the ECQ helped because it reduced, uh, it slowed down the spread of the pandemic. And as we relax the ECQ, a natural consequence is you will get more cases. I think that's a given. Um, and then as you continue to relax and give, um, allow more mobility, then you will get more cases. And I always mention in, you know, in, in, uh, to people that uh, the other aspect is that we have proximity being one of the drivers and we have Manila being the most densely populated city in the world, but followed by Pateros and Mandaluyong, and the other LGUs are very densely populated. So that helps, or that makes it uh, a bigger challenge for Metro Manila to contain the pandemic. Um, Cebu is not so densely populated, but I think, um, well, it's a different case there. Something happened and the number of cases increased. And I think uh, Dr. Tony also mentioned that Sometimes this just happens with one case, and if you're not able to monitor it, your one case can lead to uh, uh, you know, a big number, and sooner or later, it's harder to manage this. So that's why for LGUs that already have been, uh, let's say, uh, pandemic-free for a while, let's say, um, in law us, uh, maybe they have one or two cases, but it's very important for them also to monitor these new cases and not take anything for granted. Uh, aside from being prepared with their um, uh, hospitals and being ready. Um, I think um, the isolation is very important. Uh, I, I think it was mentioned somewhere that home quarantines do not work, mm -hmm. uh, at least in our case. So isolation is very important, especially if you're bringing in people from outside your province into your province, let's say overseas workers or LSIs. So. Um, and, and that is a, a really a big concern right now. Dr. Benji, but is it also not a function of more testing, the rising numbers? Because um, that's also things that the government has been saying. Yeah, but you know, there is a ceiling for it. That means that the only time that you're really succeeding is the more tests that you do, the more negatives you're getting, not the more positives. Because if you keep getting more positives, then we're not really that successful. I mean, if if we do a million tests and you get, say, a hundred thousand positives from the from the million tests, and that means that you have a positivity rate of ten percent. So, yeah, that that means that our the 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 virus is just circulating to a larger population. And um, I, I, to me, uh, your question actually on. Um, uh regarding the, the the ECQs and all of that it, we have to remember that um the R not and are effective uh whichever term that you're using they vary with social dynamics in a population uh even an easily transmitted virus can have trouble spreading in a region where people rarely meet uh, Wuhan is the perfect example. When they started, it actually was like, if we will use that, that are not or are are effective. It was like there, it was two to three, and then when they locked down in a week's time or in a month's time, sorry, they were down to one. So we know that ECQ, GCQ, and all of these um, quarantine measures will actually work. They're going to they 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 stop transmission for a while. But did but you look Dr. at it globally Tone. now. I mean, you look yes. at it globally now. You, you open up the economy, everybody starts to move, and all of the other nations all over the world that have locked down for a while are seeing the numbers go up again. Dr. Tony? Right. 
Well, <clears throat> my opinion is that um, perhaps uh, uh, Professor Guido and Benji can study this. Among the Asian countries, it's only Indonesia and the Philippines, two countries which have not flattened the curve. And I don't know whether being an archipelago uh, is an important factor uh, compared to, you know, landlocked areas uh, because of the contiguity factor and the mobility. And, and that's why we see right now cases um, transferring uh, after some time, let's say, from NCR and then Luzon, okay. But right now you see um, NCR, uh, Cebu, and then with contiguity areas like uh, Region 8, and then you have Caraga. Now, the same problem also with Indonesia, aside from being one of the most populated countries in the world, it's difficult to manage an archipelago. And we need, and with finite resources and different cultures, then we have a problem. But that would not stop us from reopening the economy because the virus will be with us for the next two years. And therefore, after hammering it, you need to dance right now and use all available resources to increase the healthcare capacity and fight it on. That, that's my suggestions right now. But for those increases, acute acceleration, you need really to, to lock down and then reopen the economy by dancing with it. So, I mean, should, should we go back to ECQ and increase our health capacity, or is that have we passed that stage? No, no. the ECQ is based on the uh, if that particular epicenter is the finance epicenter. So we have to do that with NCR and Cebu. Now, for other areas not considered vital in terms of uh, financing, then they can actually um, you know do some you know. But I mean, GCQ. for Metro Manila, we're already on uh, GCQ, GCQ, right? GCQ. So we can't go, we, it, it's, it's unimaginable it, to yeah. go back to GCQ. Right. So the strategy here is the zoning and the gradual and the phasing and usually the granular data by barangays or by by community, by sitio or by building or by street. That That was the strategy right now. And I would agree with Benji, it should not be a lockdown of two days. Then you have to complete the lockdown of 14 days and then clean it up so, so that it will not actually recur. Ang problema yung relapse eh. Ang problema niya yung relapse. So therefore, kailangan ayusin yung blueprint uh, per lockdown. Kasi I'm seeing right now two days, three days, lockdown, and then may relapse ka in another barangay. But because people are moving eh. So it, it should be clear that 14 days dapat mm -hmm. are, are we actually doing uh, worse than others, uh, Professor Guido, based on the numbers that you're seeing? Because uh, last weekend, there was this huge story about uh, WHO data, not a WHO statement, but data from the WHO that showed the Philippines had uh, more than 8,000 cases from 2016. To June 28, and then the next one was the thousand. So what does that? Mean? Hello. Yes. So, sorry, it's getting a bit choppy. Yes. Um, regarding other countries, we haven't really looked at uh, or compared how we are doing. I mean. From my understanding, WHO didn't make a statement that we were the worst. It was just the, an interpretation of the data. Um, definitely, we are lagging behind our neighbors for sure, aside from Indonesia and maybe possibly Singapore. But most of our Asian neighbors are actually underway to at least economic recovery, maybe, uh, especially Vietnam. Western Pacific, not East, Western Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Western Pacific, but um, uh, so I haven't really made a uh, check uh, to compare. I mean, we've just really been focusing on the Philippines. So I, I would say that maybe um, I think that Indonesia is also getting a lot of cases, but right now we're not, you know, we're not doing so well right now. I mean, uh, the numbers are getting, you know, getting bigger. So they're starting to become really scary. Uh, there are some positives, of course, and. Uh, um, the death rate is um, decreasing, or at least it's stable. So I'm not sure if there's 
anecdotal data that, or anecdotal uh, um, statements that uh, there are more deaths than reported. But uh, as far as the Department of Health data for deaths, at least there it is stable. So Actually, yes. I was going to ask that next. Uh, the, the, the argument of the health department is that although the numbers are increasing, the total number is increasing, um, that most of these cases are actually mild cases and that our case fatality rate remains lower than the global average. Uh, your comment, uh, Dr. Benji? Yeah, um, I, I think that's an unfair comparison. Um, you have to remember the case fatality rate is not the final mortality rate of the country. So case fatality rate is not a very good approximation of the actual death rate for coronavirus in the Philippines. The, the mortality rate should be, but, but we've not ended this pandemic, so we cannot compute for the mortality rate. So that, that, that's one. Second, uh, you have to take into consideration that the more the patients are, the more people there are. Like if you have 10 million people and you just say, oh, that's 5% is going to, only 5% will die. Well, that's half a million, right? Mm -hmm. So the more cases we get and then you just say, oh, that, never mind. The Philippines has only 1 million cases, but only 2% will die. But that, 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 that's what? That's a big but, number. Yeah. See? And we don't want to be part of the statistic because we don't know how many deaths there are. Uh, how many other diseases have that same number of deaths? Because we're just halfway into the year. Yeah. You have to remember that. It's just like we're, we're six months into the year for the Philippines. And all of the other countries have different starting points. We started sometime in January but picked up sometime in March. So that means that if we really look at the pickup, that we're three, mo three months only into it, we have 1,200 deaths. Right. Dr. Tony, does it matter that, you know, yeah. the have more mild cases than severe cases, that we don't have as many deaths as, let's say, the United States no. or Brazil? I'm, I'm concerned about asymptomatic cases because they are the spreaders. Uh, because in these uh, asymptomatic cases, particularly the, the young ones, will go home right there in their, um, in their household, in their families. They may actually transmit the diseases to the vulnerable patients and that their parents. So that's my worry. That's number one. Now, the case fatality rate, when you compare globally, okay. But when you compare with your Asian neighbors, we are actually one of the lowest, um, more, one of the highest is a case fatality rate. And then, sorry for this comment, yung about per capita, when you compare with Singapore, naturally Singapore is, is small, and then 105 million tayo. But let's compare with a country like Vietnam, with 96 million population, and poorer than us, 10 times of their GDP, but they have zero deaths right now, and only 349 cases. And in Asia, Thailand ng Indonesia at Pilipinas ang nagre-register ng deaths. All other countries, no more active deaths right now. So, ganun dapat, hindi, dapat ganun ang pag-base natin. Eh. I think we're stonewalling our information. And then, they made the graph, uh, Western Pacific, including India, Pakistan and all. So, I went to the map. Eh, sabi ko, more of more of ano na to eh, uh, more on um, the Middle East, 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 East countries na yun eh. So you're, hindi siya apple to apples. Pangalawa, it's outside of the classification ng Western Pacific. So ang tawag ko dun stonewalling eh. Um, um, and I noticed that they are trying to defend right now rather than accepting that and move on to make our statistics better. You, you did mention that one of the problems is them not being being able to accept criticism. You stand by that? Right. I mean, a lot of people. Uh, uh, you, you have the Senate right now telling us about this, and then you have the Ombudsman telling about the failure of the DOH in data management, uh, lapses, and all. These are legitimate institutions. These are institutional comments, aside from, of course, the netizens. But these are institution. So, should we turn a blind eye to these uh, institutional comments and recommendations? 
I think we should not. We should actually use this as a challenge for us to improve more. Ano nangyayari? We turn a blind eye, we stonewall it, and then not accept, and then, eto, na-surprise tayo, meron tayong epicenter right now in Cebu. Diba? I mean, the the attitude should be like in other countries. Like, kung ande talaga sa US, eto, tinan mo, Brazil, yun talaga. Walang stonewalling. Yun talaga ang data. So, tayo, hindi natin i-accept right now. And in trying to manage our data to the advantage, of course, of the government, dun tayo nagkakaproblema. Dapat dito in crisis, dapat talaga transparent dito so that we can prepare the people. Y- yun ang, that's, my, that's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Guido and uh, Doc Benji both reacted. So, um, do you have anything to add? <laughs> well, um, I may speak first. Um, yeah, I agree that the transparency of data is very important. Because in the end, parang if we are not transparent with the data, sino uh, lina I mean, in the end, it will be it will just backfire uh, because it means we might not be able to uh, provide the appropriate solutions and response. To what's happening. But yeah, if there's an emerging crisis, and uh, tinago na lang yan, uh, it's like we sweep the information under the rug, hoping that nobody will see and it will just pass. But that's not gonna happen. That's like a very uh, that's like you know response of a child na nakuwili mong you know doing something and then itatago na lang yan, you know, drop the lollipop, itatago na lang yan under the table or something. So um, we need uh, transparency. For sure, and I also want to mention about the asymptomatics. This is also a real challenge for us. Uh, the percentage of asymptomatics is only three percent, uh, around three percent, based on their data, and this is very low. We we expect thirty, maybe even forty percent. So by our estimates, there are at least eight thousand asymptomatics, maybe more, who are spreading the the pandemic. Um, they said that asymptomatics are not as contagious. But I think they're still uh, able to spread the pandemic, and that's why we are very we're having a very hard time uh, containing the pandemic because we're not identifying the asymptomatics. We're not iso- we're not able to isolate them. We're not able to control them. They could be out there. They're not going to be uh, if they go to the mall. You know, the thermal scanner is not going to detect them. They don't have a fever or anything. I mean, they they themselves they don't, they don't know about it possibly, so they can't even self isolate. And uh, th- that also leads to the problem with the testing, and uh, we, we really have to scale up testing um, even more. I know I think we're getting about fifteen thousand uh, tests per day, but that's still you know we we still need more than that, especially if we're planning to open up the economy even more. We need more testing. Doc Benji, um, I mean, looking at the testing backlog, um, presidential spokesperson Harry Roque said. It's more than a thousand, but I'm looking at the latest DOH situation right now, and the testing backlog is actually at more than twelve thousand. That is a huge difference from just over a thousand. Yeah, well, I don't know where they share and how they share their information, but they need to sing the same song. Um, that they're not in tune. And that's where a lot of misinformation comes from or disinformation. And that's when people panic because one says something, the other one says another thing. So they don't know which part, uh, who, who, who to actually believe in. Um, regarding the asymptomatics, I agree with both Tony and uh, Professor Guido regarding this. Um, it's more on... Um, they don't have a category for pre-symptomatics. You have to remember that patients can be asymptomatic from the beginning and then go on to developing symptoms later on. And usually there's a window for that and that's usually around three to five days. So I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm putting my infectious disease hat on. Oh. So, <laughs> so that means that, that um, you see sometimes there's a shift. All of a sudden the, the mild cases go up and then the asymptomatics go down. And I think that's what happens, that some of them shift into being symptomatic later on. So you're right, they're both right, that it, that's scary because they, you, you might meet somebody who's not sick today and then three days, five days down the road, you see that he's in the hospital or that he exhibits signs and symptoms. And that's when you panic because he's a, 
you're, you're exposed. Could it be that the DOH is getting too technical because the WHO has uh, classified pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic differently? And I think that may be where the DOH is uh, getting their guidance. Could it be that that's the problem? Dr. Benji? Um, <laughs> All I can tell you is that the, the, the World Health Organization only provides guidance. It is a political organization. It is not a regulatory agency. And so, um, with that said, um, we need to evaluate on how we actually move on from the classifications. I, I mean, you know, you, you, just because an organization or an organizational structure tells you that this is the way it is, then we stick to that. Uh, we, we've known that a political organization has backtracked several times on, on its several announcements also, like on the use of the mask or um, the asymptomatics not being infective and then getting a backlash from the medical community that says that, uh, of course, they are also at the same time because if you join them and then you share the same food, put dip the same spoon into the, the food that you guys eat, then you probably will, will, will transmit the infection from somebody who may be more susceptible. Because not all of us exhibit the same, the same response to any infection. Like a cold to me, may be severe to you and so on and so forth so that's the second thing and uh, with respect to um the 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 retesting as well that's another thing remember the who wanted the two retests of a negative sample before they even say that you've recovered uh, and let, you know how painful it is to have a nice a nasopharyngeal swab for RT-PCR. I mean, you will cry. You will really cry. It's really, really painful. I've had uh, I've had rapid tests, and I know they're not entirely reliable. But um, I've uh, done two rapid tests, and right. thankfully, I'm my negative, patients. But I'm, I do that. They can't. Cry. Yeah, I know they're not reliable, but um, I've 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 not had symptoms really for me to do the RT-PCR test, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, again, Dr. Tony, like, like I said, it's, it's it's really a waste of resources as well because we know that after the fourteen days, days. The, the fourteen days window, after the fourteen days window, the reliability of the RT PCR actually drops, and even if the patients remain positive, because I have patients that stay positive even six times after, they've had repeat swabs for the sixth time and they're still positive. We don't. The the RT PCR can tell you that yes. He has positive coronavirus, but he that will not. He has positive SARS-CoV-2, but it will not tell you whether they are skeletal remnants or they are live viruses, for that matter. Uh, Dr. Tony, is the DOH too reliant on WHO? Uh, maybe um, they used to have the WHO as a partner, but um, at, at this point in time, I think uh, I'm not sure whether they're, they're separate right now. And even uh, the palace would contest right now the statements of the WHO. And I believe Benji, uh, for the longest time, always challenged the status quo. I do not believe in political organizations. And uh, nobody has seen an, a pandemic of this kind. So therefore, I usually go to a reference model. Let's say uh, Ebola outbreak, South Korean model, Vietnam model. Uh, Taiwan model, rather than based on the WHO. And then I also uh, look at Benji's um, uh, blogs and then uh, UP. Then I, I also go to John Hopkins and then the CDC. And then you come up with a personal consolidated you know, decision that you can actually advise the public. But I do not rely on WHO only. And uh, based on my experience, because of their pre flopping uh, statements before, I've lost confidence in them, and I'm sorry with due respect to them, but this is a different scenario where where a different references and different uh, key opinion leaders should step up to the plate to help the country right now and not be dependent on a political organization. Okay. Um, 
we've been going for uh, almost an hour and a half. So thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for your time. But um, I do have a couple more questions. And uh, maybe this is a bit political, but I do want to get um, your reaction, Professor Guido, of uh, Secretary Harry Roque's uh, statement, saying that, well, um, he did clarify that he was referring to the Filipino people. So he was saying that the Filipino, Filipino people won against the UP prediction. What is your reaction to that? Well, um, I enjoyed the memes that I saw, but uh, some of them were a bit, <laughs> I mean, were a bit harsh. Um, but, but I mean, but, but for entertainment purposes, I mean, they were entertaining. Um, but uh, uh, it was not about, uh, at least for me, I mean, you know, we're not in uh, competition with the government. We're actually trying to work with the government. We're providing information that government can use because uh, we all wanted we all want the same thing. We want to help uh, solve this pandemic. Um, and we each have our own contributions, the media, uh, scientists, doctors, uh, frontliners, politicians, government officials. So um, so we want to be, we, we want to work with them. And um, now these projections that I mentioned earlier, these are just like barometers for us to say that, okay, this was our estimate or our projection last month. And it means that if we did more or less the same thing, we're gonna reach the projection. That's that's the bottom line. If nothing improves, if it doesn't improve or it doesn't get worse, it, we're gonna meet that projection. If we miss that projection, if we miss it by a lot, if that that's a win for everyone, including us. I mean, it, it's, you know, I'm not, this is not something I'm betting on and I'm saying, okay, I bet, my money on it hitting 40,000. So no, I'm not happy if it hits 40,000. It just says that is the projection. It's just a mathematical uh, quantity. It does not have any sentiment to it. It's, you know, it's not, so, there's no bias in it. So it's just the, the projection. And if we hit it, if, if we're better than that, we're happy. So if, if the government says the numbers were below 40,000, if there was a slight improvement, then I'm happy that there was a slight improvement. Um, I don't know about the details of the backlog or anything like that. Um, I don't have to know about that, but um, my my general perception is that we more or less per performed the same as the projection. So it was not that far. So I'm not saying that because I'm saying that we did hit 40,000. I'm just saying that if we did improve, the improvement was very slight, and we need to do more. So we need to focus on what we what we can do. It means that maybe what we're doing is not working, and we have to change what we're doing. Maybe we need better data. We need um, more timely data. Maybe we need um, better response from uh, better cooperation from everyone. Uh, people need to be doing their part also. Uh, but of course, it's not just their responsibilities, everyone's responsibility. So maybe we need to scale up, um, we do need to scale up testing, and I think it was already mentioned um, by Dr. Tony, and Dr. Benchy, that um, we need to do more isolation, we need to prepare the you know, health facilities, hospitals, to be better prepared for uh, any possible surge in, in the pandemic. So it, it means that we need to improve on what we're doing. We can't just be happy and patting ourselves on the back. Um, we, we, we have to, you know, have to work harder and um, try to get this pandemic, um, you know, okay. down. Final question uh, for uh, Dr. Benji and Dr. Tony. Are we winning in the fight against COVID? Dr. Benji. Oh, seriously? No. Um, the cases need to go down. The measure of success is when we're able to really bend the curve. And uh, uh, during the first part of the uh, pandemic, during the ECQ, we were able to do that in spite and despite some of the backlogs. And uh, unfortunately, um, it's, a, it's something you need to weigh between the economy and um, going back to a new normal. But we have 
a greater population that is below the socioeconomic status. And therefore, we are ripe actually for a pandemic that can blow out of proportion because of the density of uh, the national capital region. And when it spills over to the adjacent provinces, then it becomes a more serious problem because most of the resources are within the national capital region and in the more urbanized areas. So we need to bring the cases down. That, that my, 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 my last comment would be just be that the only way you can see that you are succeeding is that the more tests we're doing, the less positives we're getting. All right, Dr. Tony, final word. Final word. Um, let me bridge the statement regarding the reference model of UP. Uh, at first, I was really delighted with a lot of memes and, of course, the social media reaction to the presidential spokesperson. But reflecting on that, I'm really sorry about about the particular comment I'm trying to beat UP because it's not a contest; it's a reference model just like in new york when uh governor andrew como would report to the to the public there are many reference models or forecasts you have the bill gates model then the, the columbia university models and basically what you're going to do is not to reach that particular war scenario by actually acknowledging the recommendations of the group you have to look at the recommendation so that you will not reach the 40 and not try to outdo the 40 by saying that in public, but create a new blueprint in the next 100 days on what went wrong and what went right, and then try to improve the situation. So let me bridge that. So since we don't have right now a blueprint in the next 100 days and the cases are actually increasing, you have two epicenters right now. And then you, you have risk communication problems. And then there's no sense of urgency. And then you have stonewalling. We're up for a bigger problem right now and a bigger pandemic. We're not winning it actually. We're losing it right now. And you can see that and a lot of people are actually observing. But if we continue the way that we are behaving, being conservative and not being aggressive, we might actually up for a bigger war and a bigger pandemic. Well, that sounds really dire. I hope that changes. I really hope that changes. But on that note, uh, we're ending the program. Thank you so much to the three gentlemen, Professor Guido David of the UP Octa Research Team, Dr. Benjamin Ko of uh, USC Hospital, and Dr. Tony Liachon, uh, former advisor of the National Task Force for COVID. 19. And thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. Again, this is Viewpoint on NYK's Facebook page, live every Saturday at 6 in the evening. My name is Barnaby Lowe. Again, this is Viewpoint. Now you know.